Hi, I'm Ryan Contreras, and I'm an associate professor of ornamental plant breeding in the Department of Horticulture. I'm standing in a field of um, uh, butterfly bush, or uh, budlia, and uh, this is also a plant that uh, has escaped cultivation, and uh, budlia davidii was actually banned in Oregon in uh, the early to mid-2000s. And the reason why we're working on, on this plant is, uh, first of all, it was, it was banned uh, in Oregon, but there's been a lot of breeding that's uh, uh, been directed to develop sterile forms. And so uh, around the time when I came on board, around 2007-8, uh, there was actually an amendment that allowed uh, for a few different uh, 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 exceptions under the ban. So one was if there was a Budlia davidii cultivar that had 98% uh, reduction in fertility, and another was uh, if it was, could be confirmed to be an interspecific hybrid with some other species of Budlia. Okay? So following that, we had 14 cultivars that were approved for uh, uh, propagation, uh, production, and sale in Oregon. So we've included as many of those in this study as we can, as well as some of the old-timey uh, fertile forms and some uh, experimental lines uh, from a, uh, a worldwide breeding company. The point of this study is to uh, evaluate the fertility of all of the cultivars that we have uh, in this study uh, to determine if those interspecifics are actually uh, fertile or not. The basis being uh, uh, oftentimes when you cross two different species you can get a, a sterile mule as it were. So if you cross a horse and a donkey you get a mule and uh, which is a sterile dead end. Um, however, in plants, uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes hybrids are sterile and sometimes they're not. Uh, <clears throat> and so, with this study, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to help the Oregon Department of Agriculture refine uh, their rules on uh, Budlia to make sure that the, uh, the nursery and landscape industries, and gardeners for that matter, have as many options as possible while also ensuring that they are ecologically safe. So we want to have them grow as many cultivars as possible, but not ones that are going to uh, escape cultivation. Now there's a lot that's going into this. We have uh, uh, 34 different cultivars, and you can see that there's a wide variety of forms from more compact and sort of intermediate forms like we have here. There are much larger, and you can uh, uh, immediately tell the old-timey forms are the larger, more rangy, uh, cultivars. There are some more prostrate forms and really uh, I, I have been blown away by the variety of flower forms uh, in here. You can clearly see that their uh, breeding has incorporated a lot of different species. So included in this uh, are fertile checks like Budlia davidii black knight. So this is an old-timey cultivar. This is like what you know we talk about grandma cultivars. This one's been around a very long time and uh, it is known for, to have high fertility. So when we talk about the 98% reduction in fertility, cultivars like Black Knight are the ones that are gonna set that 100% bar. So we'll take a mean of the fertile cultivars like Black Knight and get our baseline and then compare all of the cultivars uh, to these fertile ones. And also just pointing out the relative size of this. In the nursery and landscape industries, everything has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the years, and so we're breeding for more compact uh, habits and getting away from cultivars like Black Knight. This is uh, Budlia weyeriana honeycomb, and this is one, actually this was my, my first foray into research as an undergraduate student. I did some uh, chromosome squashes on uh, honeycomb, so it's kind of near and dear uh, to my heart, but you can see it has uh, yellow flowers, and this is an interspecific hybrid, and uh, I think it's one of the, the earlier uh, cultivars that it wasn't bred for sterility, um, but it has very low fertility compared to cultivars like uh, Black Knight. So um, I would say this is somewhat of an old-timey cultivar, but is actually one that has relatively low fertility. Okay, so this is uh, uh, Budlia blue chip. And so uh, I have to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Denny Werner. Uh, he's a, a professor emeritus at North Carolina State University. So I mentioned that I got to do some cytogenetics in honeycomb. It was actually with uh, Dr. Werner. So this is what modern breeding uh, can do. You saw black knight and how large it is and how high the fertility is. 
And now we have modern cultivars bred by the likes of Dr. Werner that give us a much more compact cultivar that has uh, virtually no fertility. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, interspecific hybrids have been commonly used in uh, butterfly bush, and this is one illustrating that. This is uh, Budlia Grand Cascade, and you can see the really dramatic inflorescences on here, much, much larger than any of the old-timey cultivars that we would see, and this is through the incorporation of uh, different species uh, of Budlia. Like most of the plants out here in the plots, we're, we're in late August, so we're getting a little bit past the prime, uh, so you can see there's a lot of spent ones, but really dramatic, very fragrant uh, when it's in full flower. Again, we're, we're most focused on uh, the, the sterility aspect, but uh, closely incorporated in this is uh, the attraction to pollinators. So uh, we're working closely with uh, Dr. Gail Langolato, who's an entomologist, and uh, uh, looking at the impact of breeding for sterility on pollinator attraction. And so uh, we have a graduate student, Kara Still, working on this and she is looking at uh, a, a whole myriad of different traits of, of these plants. Hi, I'm Kara. I'm a master's student in Dr. Contreras' lab and my project is dealing with sterile versus fertile Budlia cultivars. So we are evaluating the sterile varieties, mostly dealing with pollinator attraction, pollinator nutrition, um, and then also seeing if the new sterile varieties are sterile in controlled crosses in the greenhouse and also when they're mixed in with the old fertile varieties out in the field. Um, so for the pollinator aspect, what we've been taking care of this summer is pollinator counts. So we come out here anytime there's a plant that's over max flower, and I would call this probably about max flower. So you want about 50% of the inflorescences open, blooming, attracting pollinators. And then we just sit and watch the plant for five minutes <clears throat> and identify the visitors to morphology. So that's as simple as like, are there honeybees, bumblebees, um, other bees, green bees, moths, butterflies, that sort of thing. And so we're just getting a general count over the season that will collate at the end of the season to see which cultivars are more or less attractive. We're also going to be doing some light pollen analysis um, to see if the sterile cultivars hold up against the old fertile cultivars in terms of protein and fatty acid content. Um, I think that's a really important aspect if we're going to be planting out a bunch of new fun sterile varieties are they as good for pollinators as the old fertile varieties um, and we'll also be looking to see if the new sterile varieties are producing as much nectar because that's an important piece of pollinator attraction um, and that's mostly what we've been doing this summer we're also working right now to contain the spread of a potentially invasive species by bagging any spent flowers before they have a chance to develop tons of capsules and release themselves into the wild. Um, so that's why you see kind of deadheading around the field. That's what my colleague Andrew is working on, uh, clipping and bagging. Uh, earlier in the season, we were trying to bag in the field um, just with white plasticine bags on the plant to see if there was a difference between clipping and bagging in terms of shoot production but that turned out to be kind of a lot so now we're just bagging inflorescences and taking them into the greenhouse uh, later in the term i will be weighing all the inflorescences produced by every single plant to see which cultivars are producing more floral tissue <laughs> Um, and combining that with the pollinator attraction data um, to see if there's any correlation between the two. And also later this season, we will be counting seedlings from our control crosses in the greenhouse. Um, and that's just an easy metric to see which crosses are producing more uh, viable seedlings. So we're crossing a variety of sterile cultivars onto the old fertile cultivars and vice versa. 
um, to really test that out. We're also taking data on the basis of consumer preference. So we're not doing a whole ton of that this year. Basically, I'm going around and smelling all of the flowers and trying to get an idea of like which ones are smelling like what. So on the basis of like kind of like a base note, um, I'll say, oh, this one's more honey, this one's more fruity, this one I would say is more spicy. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing along those lines this year. And then next year we'll actually be working with the master gardeners to get a, an evaluation done just based on aesthetics. So they'll be coming out here and rating them um, based on probably color will be a metric we'll use. Um, and then just overall general, does this plant look good and can I see it um, of use in a yard? And, and so really exciting project. We, we, um, there's a lot of science in here, but we're also, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this because it has direct impact on the nursery industry, on the landscape industries, and on the home gardener. So um, more to come on Budlia. Um, and we hope to see some in uh, the garden center soon. Mm -hmm.